On June 6, 1944, the Allies invaded Normandy in order to drive the Germans out of France and win the war. The Allied leaders had extensively planned every last detail of the initial landings, but an unwelcome surprise was that the terrain in Normandy behind the beaches was Bocage country. Over the last millennium, the French peasants had built up dirt mounds of thick banked rock walls to delineate the borders of the fields and to keep their cattle and sheep in. There were also trees, hedges, and vines that grew up above the dirt and provided a real boundary between fields. Narrow sunken roads were the only pathways between these banks. The main problem with the hedgerows was that they favored the defender and was a nightmare for the attacker. Allied leaders had no solutions at first, but over the first few weeks gradually worked out the tactics to overcome the hedgerows. Lieutenant William Arendt, a platoon leader in the 29th Infantry Division who fought in Normandy, in his book Midnight of the Soul, stated, In my opinion, hedgerow fighting is the toughest in the world, with the possible exception of close contact jungle warfare. Once the fighting moved off the beaches, the Germans brought in reinforcements and started to properly defend the hedgerows. They developed many tactics that could be overcome, but caused high casualties for the attacker. A typical hedgerow would be two to four hundred yards of length and width, and it had an irregular shape. The defending Germans would have pre-planned mortar sites within the fields. The Germans would have five MG-34 machine guns embedded in the hedges. There would be two MG-42 machine guns at the ends further back. On the sides, in the middle, there would be two anti-tank weapons to hit the Allied tanks from the flank. The Germans would cover the entire field with crossfire so the attackers could be hit from all sides. Prior to Operation Cobra and the development of the Rhino tank, the Allies would use these tactics. There would be a hedgerow gap chosen, which would be where the follow-on troops would go. The goal at the end of the field would be chosen. In Phase 1, a couple of platoons would line up on the jumping off point in front of a field. A Sherman tank would poke its gun through the hedge and trees and provide covering fire. Phase 2, the infantry would quickly advance across the field, trying to dodge the crossfire. The tank backs away and engineers and place charges on the hedgerow gap. In phase three, demolitions blow a gap in the hedgerow as infantry assaults the objective. In phase four, the tanks advance to help the infantry clear the objectives. Other elements move forward and prepare to continue the attack. When a Sherman tank ran over a hedge, then its thinly armored underbelly was exposed and its gun was pointed to the sky. If the Germans chose to properly defend an area, they might target that portion of the tank and knock it out. Another problem was that there was a time gap between the time the engineers blew the gap and when the tanks and infantry would follow on. The Germans would target the gap and cause horrendous casualties there. The Bocage hedgerow terrain in some areas stretched for 50 miles, which is 80 kilometers. Before Operation Cobra began, soldiers were coming up with all types of inventions to deal with the problems of the hedgerows. A hedge cutter developed by the 79th Infantry Division was in operation by July 5th. 
A few days later, 19th Corps demonstrated a set of prongs to create holes for the placement of explosives. 5th Corps also invented devices which were dubbed brush cutters and green dozers. Sergeant Bud Cullen was a tanker in the 2nd Armored Division's 102nd Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron. He was talking about how to overcome the hedgerows with the rest of his squad. A Tennessee hillbilly named Robert said, Why don't we put some saw teeth and put them on the front of the tank and cut through these hedges? Cullen recognized the idea's potential. He welded steel scrap to the front of the tank to create a hedge cutter. The teeth helped prevent the vulnerable underside of the tank from being exposed while it knocked a hole in the hedgerow wall. The steel scrap came from destroyed Czech hedgehogs from the Norman beaches. On July 14th, Lieutenant General Omar Bradley was given a demonstration. He inspected the tank and watched in awe as a hedgerow exploded to make way for the Sherman bursting through. Cullen became a very American kind of national hero. Bradley was so impressed that he ordered the device to be manufactured in quantity. Initially, this was done using steel salvaged from the thousands of Czech hedgehogs from the Atlantic Wall. The steel tusks were called the Cullen Rhino device or Cullen Hedgerow Cutter by the Americans and prongs by the British. Nearly three quarters of the U.S. 2nd Armored Division's tanks and tank destroyers were outfitted with the Tusk by the start of Operation Cobra. This is a representation of the change in tactics by American soldiers. The keys are that the hedgerow could be quickly broken by a Sherman tank going 10 miles an hour, and the Germans couldn't react as before, and most importantly, the underside of the Sherman wasn't exposed. Another key is that the gap could be made anywhere, or there could even be multiple gaps through the hedgerows. This is a clearing made by a single Sherman tank with a rhino appendage. The infantry and other tanks could quickly follow on through. War correspondent Chester Wilmot wrote that the German defensive plan to halt any American breakout was to hold the front line very lightly and to concentrate on holding the road junctions for a depth of three or four miles behind the front, with the intention of delaying any breakthrough by reducing the speed of the advance to the pace that the infantry could manage. Once Operation Cobra was launched, Allied troops were able to bypass the German positions using the Rhino tanks, thereby allowing the advance to continue, leaving the strong points to be dealt with by infantry and engineers. During the British Operation Bluecoat, Churchill tanks equipped with prongs were able to traverse terrain considered impassable to tracked vehicles. Military historian Stephen Zaloga claims that the devices were not as widely used as the legend would suggest, nor were they as effective as often believed. But Max Hastings and Chester Wilmot credit the invention with restoring battlefield maneuverability to the Allied force. Martin Blumenson states that while the device restored mobility in hedgerow country, it was of little tactical value in the breakout except possibly as a morale factor to the troops since the tanks advanced on the roads, not cross country. Cullen was mentioned in one of the last addresses by Dwight D. Eisenhower as President of the United States in a January 10, 1961 speech to the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. There was a little sergeant, his name was Cullen, and he had an idea. And his idea was that we could fasten knives, great big steel knives, in front of these tanks, and as they came along they would cut off these banks right at the ground level. They would go through at the level keel, would carry with themselves a little bit of camouflage for a while. And this idea was brought to the captain, to the major, to the colonel, and it got high enough that somebody did something about it. And that was General Bradley, and he did it very quickly. Because this seemed like a crazy idea, they did not go to the engineers very fast because they were afraid of the technical advice. And then someone did have a big question. Where are you going to find the steel for all these things? Well now, happily the Germans tried to keep us from going on the beaches with giant steel chevaux de frise, big crosses. There were big bars of steel down on the beach where the Germans left it. And he got it, got these things sharpened up, and it worked fine. The biggest and happiest group I suppose in all the Allied armies that night were those that knew that this thing worked, and it worked beautifully. These guys didn't know about Yankee ingenuity, but they sure did find out. Four months after his invention, Sergeant Cullen lost a leg and part of his thigh to a landmine in the Hutgen forest. This is a public memorial to Sergeant Cullen and his invention, which can be seen in his hometown of Cranford, New Jersey. Sergeant Curtis Grubb Cullen III was born and raised in Cranford, New Jersey on February 10, 1915. He served as a tanker with the 102nd Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron of the New Jersey National Guard, 
the Essex Troop of the 2nd Armored Division. After returning home from the war, Cullen married Bernice Enright in 1945. They lived in New York City, where he became a salesman for Shinley Industries, which were liquor distributors. Curtis Grubb is a third-generation family name arising from Patriot ancestor Colonel Curtis Grubb. Curtis was a member of the Sons of the American Revolution. Cullen died in Greenwich Village, New York, on November 20, 1963. He is buried in Fairview Cemetery in Westfield, New Jersey. Sergeant Cullen was the recipient of the Legion of Merit and the Purple Heart. There are some sources that state that Sergeant Cullen received the Medal of Honor, but he isn't on the list of Medal of Honor recipients. If you liked what you see, Hit the subscribe button or share. Thank you. This has been Immersus Tech.